the art of the NBA draft. It takes a lot of skill to be able to know the right player to draft as a certain position can either be an automatic pick or someone that can be amazing with time. But the ability to do the same thing at the later parts of the NBA draft is even more special. When you get a top five pick in the draft or even top 10, you already know or have a good idea who are the best prospects in the class and who will already get drafted. But what about those players that will drop out of the lottery range and still turn out to be great, AKA the draft steal? In today's video, I wanna go over the last 10 draft classes and find the best steal in that class compared to where they are drafted and see what made them fall to that point in the first place and just how they rose to the place they are in now in their NBA career. Because everybody has their own interesting story and they deserve to be highlighted in this video. But as usual, if you wanna see more videos like this, be sure to like the video as we are now officially on the road to 100,000 subscribers, then be sure to subscribe to be a part of that and to catch more videos. But as usual, this will be a long one, but you already know who it is. Roll it. When it comes to beating a bad habit, there are many ways to go about it. But instead of trying to go cold turkey, how about substituting it with a healthier alternative instead? Which is why I partnered with today's video sponsor, Fume, to help anybody on their journey towards better habits. Fume is a flavored air device that is an innovative and award-winning tool for the sole purpose of helping their users with their habits with their product that is completely different from the standard. Instead of it being electronic, it's completely natural. Instead of exhaling vapors, they use flavored air, which you can get a huge variety like their white cranberry, sparkling grapefruit, orange vanilla, crisp mint, or even raspberry lemon. And don't worry, there are no chemicals involved. Fume uses all natural delicious flavors in their products, and with your Fume, it comes with an adjustable airflow dial, and it is designed with movable parts and madness for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing while breaking your habit. Stopping a habit is something that people consider to be hard, but switching the Fume is easy to do, and they already stirred over 100 150,000 customers and have thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking your journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com slash Alvini or scan the QR code and use code Alvini to get 10% off when you get your journey pack today. That's tryfumefum.com and use code Alvini to save an additional 10% on your order today. Thank you for Fume for sponsoring today's video and let's get back into it. Two things you only dreamed would come together. A delicious cheesy quesadilla. If you are watching the second round of the 2014 NBA draft, then congratulations, you are a certified NBA diehard because no one watches the second round of the draft, unless you're me. But if you are watching this round, you're either gone from your seat due to commercials or captivated by the schlop called Taco Bell to not notice the name that was drafted. Nikola Jokic from Serbia, the 41st pick of the 2014 NBA draft and the biggest draft steal of all time possibly. At the time of him being drafted, Drafted, he was a complete unknown in the NBA draft process and completely under the radar. But just like with Jerry Krause scouting Tony Kukoc ever since his early days in the European circuit, the same was done with him when it came to Jokic and the Denver Nuggets. And it all started with his play in Serbia, where team executive Tim Connolly would see his array of post moves, his fancy passes, and his shooting range as something really valuable for a teenage prospect. And to take a chance on this potential game changer, the Nuggets drafted Jokic with the 41st pick, but what Tom Connolly didn't expect was for Jokic's game and progress to be so linear as a prospect. After one more year of service in Serbia, he would average 16 points, nine rebounds, and three assists at the time. The potential of him being a true nucleus of the offense was right there in front of him, and it was up to the Nuggets to make that happen. But Jokic would have to earn it in playing time in a completely different environment in the end. BA. However, one of the main reasons he became what he is today is due to the coaching and system of Mike Malone, who is an immediate fan of his game and gave him every chance immediately to make something happen. Going from starting behind Kenneth Fareed and Joffrey Laverne to being a starter in only his 13th game of his career. From there, you see him just operate as a full-time starter of him averaging 10 points, 7 rebounds, and 2 assists per game in his rookie season. And as the years go by, you see the Nuggets gain more and more confidence in him and make him a more vital part of 
their team. Going from 10 points a game and two assists in his rookie season to 16 and five in his sophomore year and ending up being the runner up in the MIP voting ballot to 18 and six in his third season to now being an all-star level player averaging 18 points, 10 rebounds and six assists per game. From there, you already know how the story goes. He makes his first ever all-star game in 2019, made all NBA first team and got major considerations for his first ever MVP trophy, made the conference finals in the next season in the bubble year and then proceeded to win two straight MVPs, making him the lowest rated draft pick to ever win an MVP trophy and the second ever second round pick to ever be an MVP of the NBA. Of course, his accolades go even deeper than that, like being fourth in career triple doubles and will probably be the leader of that stat when he retires and only third all time in assists for centers behind Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Wilt Chamberlain. But the accolades that does him the most justice to this day is the fact that he led the Denver Nuggets to their first ever NBA championship last year in dominant fashion and is looking for a second and beyond alongside another MVP title. Sometimes in life, it takes meeting the right person at the right time to create an opportunity of a lifetime. And the fact that Jokic and Tim Connolly were able to meet and create what the Nuggets are now has to be the best thing that has ever happened to the both of them. And what makes it even better is that almost immediately, the Nuggets are training Jokic into what he is now and making him a leader in the modern day NBA. But while Jokic is the absolute gold, no, platinum standard of what an NBA draft still is, we are probably never going to get a story similar to this anytime soon, especially considering that he was scouted to beat this person so early on. So as we look at the rest of these nine draft steals I have to present to you, just know that Jokic is definitely one of one, even in this circumstance, just like he is on the court. In the 2015 NBA draft, everybody was sure that the best player in the class was going to be the seven foot versatile center from Kentucky, Carl Anthony Towns, and that was the end of the story. But almost a decade later, the talks around that in retrospect has changed. But what was even more surprising is the fact that the best player in this class and the steal of the draft was someone who played on the same Kentucky Wildcats team and someone who came off the bench of that team. That would be the 13th pick of the 2015 NBA draft class. Devin Booker from the University of Kentucky. The 2015 Wildcats team had NBA talent all over, but not everyone could shine on that team, obviously. A team with Cat, Willie Cauley-Stein, the Harrison Twins, and Trey Lyles all in the starting lineup alone means that someone had to come off the bench and play a role. And that person was the freshman guard, Devin Booker. But despite being the sixth man, he was still the third leading scorer on the team, impressively enough, and played a really important role in their undefeated season and helping that team make it all the way to the final four before losing to Wisconsin in that game. And of course, after that legendary season, he went to the draft and was thought to be a solid scorer in the league, but was completely underrated in the process due to his lack of volume at Kentucky and the lack of an all around upside. Again, mainly just being a scorer in the league and that was all he was looked at. But he would see multiple guards taking over him like Emmanuel Moutier and Mario Hazonia alongside other prospects and Justice Winslow and Stanley Johnson both being taken. All for the same reason, they showed out in their friendship year, unlike Devin Booker, who just simply played his role and succeeded from it. But being drafted to the Suns came with a lot of advantages, mainly in the form of him being the primary scorer option as early as his second season in the league, where he went from averaging 13 points a game, playing alongside Brandon Knight and Eric Bledsoe, to 22 points a game, being the starting shooting guard alongside Eric Bledsoe and earning MIP considerations in that sophomore year. But while you saw those same players I mentioned before struggled, who got drafted before him, D. Book was already showing off that his scoring potential in the NBA was meant to be taken seriously. The only problem is that he would continue to get better and better and more efficient as a scorer. However, he was lacking big time in the winning department, which would even underrate him as a player even more. That would change though when they hired Monty Williams and traded for Chris Paul in the summer of 2020, which turned into Devin Booker in the Suns going 51 and 21 that year, seeing Devin Booker become a two-time All-Star and of course, making it all the way to the NBA Finals. Unfortunately, they did lose in said finals, but the quick turnaround the Suns made in two seasons is something you don't usually see from an NBA franchise. After that point, Devin Booker will become a household name and become a real candidate for one of the best shooting guards in the NBA for a time, earning all NBA first team status the year after for the first time in his career and even being fourth in the MVP ballot. Since then, you see him constantly stay in the race as one of the best and consistent scorers at the guard position and be set up for opportunities to make another finals run, especially when they traded for Kevin Durant. But we just got to see 
see how that turns out because that championship window is dwindling year by year especially this season where the Suns are hovering around the same place as they were last season record wise but again Devin Booker turned his doubters come draft day into supporters seeing how he went from a six man on a Kentucky bench his freshman year into possibly the best player in the draft itself and the steal of the 2015 class when you see the 2016 draft class, you're reminded of just how hyped up it was and how many all-stars are created from it. Whether it's his first three selectees or one of the best big men right now and triple-double threat DeMontis Sabonis. But the steal of the 2016 class has to be someone that had zero expectations when he was drafted and a complete unknown in the draft process. And that person is the 27th pick of the class, Pascal Siakam. Pascal Siakam. At New Mexico State coming in as a freshman, he found himself on a pretty polarizing team with eight underclassmen, including himself, and only four upperclassmen. And with that, he got the opportunity to be a consistent starter on his team, and because of that, became all WAC first team in his freshman year, averaging 12 points and seven rebounds a game, while leading the Aggies to being the conference champion. But the next year, he leveled up even more, averaging 20 points and 11 rebounds while being the player of the year in his conference. And to do what he did, even if it isn't in the best conference in the NCAA it's still something you can use to be drafted in the NBA so after the season ended Pascal would find himself mainly as a late to early second round option due to the fact that his game at New Mexico State didn't really translate the best in the modern day NBA where it's all about driving in defensive versatility and shooting but for the people who know how Raptors president Usai Ujiri likes to draft he usually takes up on guys with size and length all over and wants to see them be molded into all-around products. Bruno Caboclo, DeLon Wright, OG Ananobi, Scotty Barnes, you can definitely see there's a real pattern here. So with the Raptors being in a good position team-wise, there's no pressure for Pascal to produce immediately as the Raptors already have a core that is successful. But he did get opportunities to do something immediately, being a day-one starter for the Raptors and being a primary role player throughout his rookie season until they traded for Serge Ibaka at the trade deadline from the Magic. But as his third season came around, that's where you see the Pascal Siakam we all know of today finally come into form and it mainly came from him playing second fiddle to Kawhi Leonard who was traded to the Raptors and he made a huge effort to make his game more productive in a Nick Nurse guided offense and it was a match made in heaven seeing his averages soar from seven points a game to 17 points in that next season and being the second leading scorer of a Raptors team that went 58 and 24 while also winning the most improved player award in his third season in the league coming a long way as a late first round pick but after winning his first championship we see Kawhi Leonard go to LA and from there it became Pascal Siakam's team and every year you see him produce at a high level but it came with a lot of grief not leading to many wins and constantly being underrated by fans and viewers of the league alike since Kawhi left the Raptors in this four-year span he'd averaged 22 points eight rebounds and five assists a game all-star level numbers but only seeing two all-star spots in those four seasons in the east and only making the all-nba team twice even with the accolades he's earned Pascal will probably continue to be one of the most underrated players in the league and will continue to earn these type of marks in silence but in the current day he is now back in a winning situation playing alongside Tyrese Halliburton in Indiana and working towards making it back to the NBA playoffs and competing on one of the best offenses in the NBA and league history but to think this all started from a drafting trend by one man in Toronto that turned into the franchise's first ever championship and it turned him into a two-time All-Star and a two-time All-NBA product. Both sides took a risk and both sides profited from it. Just like the 2016 class, the 2017 class came next and created a star-studded cast of players in almost every level of the draft. When it came to picking the steal of the draft, it was really hard on who to settle on. For me personally, you have a tale of two sides. First, you have the last pick of the lottery, the 14th pick, Bam Adebayo, and the 29th pick of the Spurs and Derek White. But both players are really influential to their team's success in many ways and are absolute shutdown defenders. But for the sake of this video, I'll be headlining Bam out of bio for this but just know Derek White for how far back he was drafted relative to Bam is a very 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 close second place but at Kentucky he was a very big beneficiary of a star-studded freshman class with Malik Monk and De'Aaron Fox as his backcourt earning many awards and doing the majority of the scoring for the team but as the third option Bam was doing his job as a strong and athletic center who could score with ease in the paint and guard any center that was presented with him which became a really big main positive in his draft report that could potentially 
potentially translate into a DPOY worthy player. If you ask me as a SEC enjoyer, Bam should have received way more stock than he did in the draft process, but the only negatives I can find was the fact that he was criticized for his lack of offensive game, which saw him getting put in the back burners in the draft, especially behind other big men in Larry Markkinen and Zach Levine, who all came equipped with a three-point shot out of college. So with that, he was drafted with the last pick of the lottery to the Miami Heat, and honestly, that was probably the best thing that could ever happen to him. Nowadays, we know the Heat as the team that takes these random players in the G League and turn them into productive players in the league. And Bam Adebayo was going to get the same treatment and development that they got. In his first two seasons playing behind NBA cult legend Hassan Whiteside, you see him slowly take strides as a player and develop into an all-around product. You see him become a big man that can pass the ball and create points for his teammates, averaging two a game off the bench in his second year. But once Hassan left for Portland in the offseason, he became the full-time starter and immediately started to turn head. In his first year as the Heat starting center, he'd average 16 points, 10 rebounds, and five assists a night. Numbers you don't see from centers historically, and it was all because of the Heat's training program and a lot of trial and error in game. In this season, he'd be awarded by the NBA, becoming a first-time All-Star in 2020, and was second in MIP considerations, made all NBA defensive second team, and was fifth in the DPOY ballot. Of course, in this same season, he showcased more of his skills in the NBA playoffs, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Celtics in a wild six-game series in the bubble, and making it all the way to the NBA Finals against the Lakers. Ever since then, you'd see more and more progression from Bam every year, and it became a trend for Bam to improve statistically in some way every year. But it was usually the fact that he became more aggressive scoring wise without assistance and scoring when the team needed it generally. From his first All-Star season to right now, we'd see him go from 15 points to 18 to 19 to 20 points per game last season and the same this year. But of course, his main skill will always be his defensive versatility, earning three additional All-NBA defensive honors, but never winning a DPOY award, getting as close as fourth in a ballot, which is kind of interesting to look up. At 27 years old, I still believe that Bam still has a lot of potential to add more to his game. And with the Heat, he is sure to learn a thing or two every single year. Whether extending his range out to the three-point line eventually, or well, really hopefully, creating more dimes for his teammates and just making him more aggressive scoring-wise in general, as the Heat will eventually need him to take the range of Jimmy Butler sooner or later. But after making the finals last year as the eighth seed, Bam will continue to be a very valuable piece on that team and will be known as the gem of the 2017 class that slipped away from many teams that night. Two trends we've seen go out of fashion in the NBA draft is the high selection of college players who played all four years in college or even three years and the diminishing number of small guards in the NBA itself. But what happens when you are unfortunately both of those? Well, in the case here, you get the story of the 33rd overall pick in the 2018 draft, Jalen Brunson from Villanova. In his three-year career at Villanova, he found himself as a first-year starter and going all the way to the national championship playing alongside a myriad of soon-to-be NBA talent where he'd win it in his freshman year against North Carolina off one of the best shots in NCAA tournament history. But as a very minor factor in that success, Brunson continued to stay and develop on the team until his junior year where he became the primary option, leading the Wildcats to a 36-4 record overall where he'd averaged 19 points per game on a stacked Villanova team. But just like in his freshman year, the Wildcats win another national championship against Michigan, blowing them out of the water, making Brunson an already very decorated college athlete. And instead of going for another one, it was time to take his talents to the NBA. But as he sees his other teammates in Macau Bridges, Dante DiVincenzo, and Omari Spellman all get selected in the first round, it became rather obvious while draft experts saw Jalen Brunson either as a late first or second round option. And it was due to his stature as a reported six foot two guard and the fact that the NBA was in a completely different age where his archetype isn't exactly welcomed as a long-term option unless they are the 1% of that archetype. And adding alongside the fact that he'd be 22 years old coming into his rookie season, it just continuously brought more and more doubt to his name. But finally, he was drafted 33rd overall to the Dallas Mavericks alongside Wonder Boy Luka Doncic and playing alongside another first round pick from the year before and Dennis Smith Jr. But fortunate for Jalen in his early years in the league, it seemed like this pick was very intentional starting in 54 out of 130 games in the first two seasons of his career and showed himself to have the same production from college to the NBA as a steady and efficient guard. Finally, in his third season, in 
2021 is where we see Jalen Brunson with a more defined role on this team as the sixth man averaging 12 points a game and 3.5 assists off the bench playing 25 minutes and as one of the best six men in the league where he ended up fourth in the final ballot for the award but when the Dallas Mavericks hired current coach Jason Kidd in the summer to replace Rick Carlisle and lost out on Josh Richardson in free agency Jalen Brunson would see himself promoted to the starting lineup alongside Luka Doncic to create a very dangerous backcourt where he averaged career marks and points and assists while also helping the Mavericks win 50 games in the regular season for the first time since 2015 potentially bringing in a new age of Mavericks basketball as the right hand man to Luka Doncic but going into the playoffs Jalen Brunson had something to prove and money to make in his contract year leaping to new bounds as an NBA player becoming a playoff riser helping the Mavericks go all the way to the conference finals averaging 27 points per game against the Jazz and 18 points per game against the Suns in the second round but even as they lose in five to the Warriors in the conference finals the eventual champions Brunson showed himself on the biggest stage to be a real contributor to a winning team long term and was ready to do it again with the Mavericks however as we all know the story goes the Mavs weren't willing to give him the money that he sought after which was pretty reasonable in hindsight so he skipped town to New York to play with his father as an assistant coach to be their new franchise player which a lot of people at first doubted big time with his four-year 104 million dollar deal but once again he proved them wrong balling out as their leading scorer scoring 24 points a game and leading the Knicks to the fifth seed while also ending third in the most improved player vote and of course he had to show us one more time that he's a true playoff riser and leader winning their first playoff matchup against the Cavs and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Miami Heat where he'd average 28 points per game in those two rounds but in the current day Jalen just continues to get better and prove all of his doubters wrong leading the Knicks to another playoff berth becoming a first-time all-star averaging a career high in points and assists and enjoying the New York lights with some of his Villanova teammates from college he will have a long career in the NBA with his skill set and probably stay very underrated as a player but seeing how he started off his career underrated coming out as a two-time national champion yet still being drafted in the second round and getting drafted behind his teammates I'm sure he's only going to use that fact as more fuel to further his career even more the 2019 draft to this day is one of the more underwhelming drafts, both coming into the draft and even more in retrospect. You knew who was supposed to be the best players, but after that, there was a lot of unknowns when it came to potential and upside, and with that comes bust 9 out of 10. So you'd see many names who are now out of the league, like Jared Culver, Romeo Langford, and second Dumboya all gone. But we still have the same type of risky prospects late in the first round and second round. But the steal of the 2019 draft, we would have to choose the 28th pick of the class, Jordan Poole. At Michigan, where he he spent two years he was mainly considered to be a scoring product that can get hot quick with a nice handle and just had a plain knack for getting the ball in the hoop but what didn't help him in the slightest after scoring 12 points per game on a very successful Michigan Wolverines team that went all the way to the sweet 16 was the fact that his weaknesses as a basketball player were loud he was a bad shot taker with very little offensive awareness and his defensive instincts are nowhere to be found but if you wanted someone to give you a bucket he was the person that you called on but due to that information he dropped all the way down to the 20 28th pick where he was picked up by the Golden State Warriors and usually you think that would be a death sentence considering that you had to deal with Steve Kerr and he is usually very unwilling to play young players even to a detriment as we've seen this season but just like all the players we talked about so far they came into a pretty fortunate situation where they had to use it to their advantage in the case of Jordan Poole well uh what was supposed to be another year where the Warriors competed for a chip was a year devastated by the injuries of the big three so almost immediately Poole went from a bench warmer potentially to an entire starter but I'm just going to state the obvious he was complete ass showing off every reason why scouts deemed him as unfit for the NBA game as his game didn't translate to anything productive and made him one of the worst scorers and players in the league in his rookie season but playing in a development system led organization like Golden State and having two of the best shooters in NBA history as teammates comes with major benefits if you're willing to take their advice and Jordan Poole came into the next season improves scoring 12 points per game off the bench and even better 18 points per game the year after as a starter and even ended the year fourth in the MIP race but where he impressed the most was in the 2022 NBA playoffs where Poole mostly came off the bench and showed out big time and efficiently at that scoring 17 points per game throughout the entire thing and in the playoffs against the Boston Celtics he gave the Warriors a huge boost off the bench scoring wise with multiple highlight plays and moments and with him winning his first ever championship in his third season and being a real big piece of that Jordan Poole made him look like a real piece to a championship squad contributing by putting 
putting up points on the board whenever he came in and had key contributions even as a starter during the run but we all know what happens next from here that absolutely switched up the Warriors season immediately as he and Draymond Green would get into a scuffle during practice which ended up with Poole getting punched by Draymond and thus messing up the team's chemistry but even with that Jordan Poole still came out and produced scoring a career high 20 points per game as a primary starter and earning a four-year 128 million dollar contract from the Warriors for his contributions in the Warriors winning their fourth championship in the Warriors dynasty but after a less than desirable playoff run from Poole and a wish to have a better chance to win now alongside seeing his contract as a detriment we have our current day situation with him being shipped to the Washington Wizards in the Chris Paul trade and this season despite being the draft steal of the year has been hell and then some averaging 16 points on an abysmal 40 percent from the field and 31 percent from three Jordan Poole had the luxury of not being guarded like the best player on the team to now being the top on scouting reports for every game and not having the gravity of Clay and Curry to work off of which creates his current situation after the all-star break though he comes off the bench which is unfortunate and is now back in his Warriors form but considering how things are right now that's probably not a good thing if he plays like that off the bench but not against starters but maybe he'll improve upon it next year after learning a lot of lessons trying to be the main guy of the Washington Wizards so yeah draft steal for the Warriors turns into one of the worst contracts in the NBA and it's just funny how life works sometimes huh as the years go by, we are starting to see the fall of true blue blood schools in the college basketball ranks and the aspect of being won and done factors, especially with the NIL stuff becoming a thing. The only ones that stay true currently is Duke and Kentucky. However, the strength of those prospects sometimes can be a tad bit shaky, especially in their freshman year. In the 2020 NBA draft, we see two Kentucky Wildcats drafted in the 20s, but in the one case that I want to talk about is the true steal of the 2020 draft class, and that is the 21st pick up the class Tyrese Maxey coming to Kentucky as the 10th best player of the 2019 high school recruiting class and the top rated recruit of this Wildcats team he made himself responsible for the scoring of the team but in that time in a very cluttered and congested college game Tyrese would find himself struggling to be a consistent threat on a game to game basis and it turned him into scoring 14 points per game however from 42 percent from the field and under 30 percent from three and due to that very shaky season he see himself fall behind big time in the draft boards behind other guards like Killian Hayes, Devin Vassell, Josh Green, Kira Lewis Jr., and Cole Anthony. But his problems are like any small guards problems coming from college to the NBA. How will his game translate to the NBA? And can he be a consistent threat in the league despite his height problems? Which is funny considering he's 6'3", but the NBA is kind of interesting like that. And considering how bad he had trouble scoring at the college level, especially from the three-point line, he had a lot of work to do to prove that his height coming out of high school was warranted in his rookie season you'd see glimpses of his game to what we would see now and how he can improve into a pretty good player especially when he scored 39 points in his 10th ever game in the league when his team was missing due to COVID issues but this is where he would get his real chance as he was promoted to the starting lineup the year after where he boosted his numbers to 17 points per game and once James Harden was traded to the team later on he become the perfect shooting guard for him and all of this in only his second season in the league where he was not expected to do this at all especially this fast but I think the most surprising development was the fact that he went from shooting under 30% from three in college to now being an over 40% three-point shooter in his second year with a lot of volume. Since then, the sky has been only the limit for Tyrese Maxey, even scoring more in his third season, averaging over 20 points per game for the first time in his career. And now currently after James Harden has been traded, the 76ers and himself are not missing a beat until Joel Embiid went down. Playing point guard for the team, averaging a career high 26 points per game with six assists and becoming a first-time All-Star at the same time. Maxi has a nice career ahead of him, keeping up the production he is on as one of the better scoring guards in the NBA, and now Embiid's right-hand man. The future of his career may be highly leaning on the fact of how Joel Embiid is going to be the next couple of seasons, but either way, he has already shown himself to be a straight scoring option and provide the same type of scoring output no matter the team he'll end up on. And due to what he's doing this year, he'll be looking pretty nice for a contract coming after this season. The 2021 NBA draft was the first draft as a YouTuber I really looked into fully. From draft boards to watching footage and team composition and needs, I got a good idea who I wanted to see go where and why. And the one person I was impressed by in the draft process is to steal the 2021 draft class, Alperin Sengun, the 16th pick. Just like everybody else who got to know him pre-draft wise, you've seen this tape and the comparisons were all the same. Nikola 
Jokic. And he seriously did all the things he did, but he was a lot more athletic than him. I know his athletic feats are few and far between in the NBA, but back in Europe, he was seriously dunking on everybody with a lot of disrespect included. But I thought he'd fall under the radar and go as high as the Wizards and as low as the Rockets in that draft. Well, he ended up in Houston, and even though it was a slow start for the most part, you knew with time he'd be a Jokic-like clone. In his rookie season, mainly off the bench, he'd average nine points, five rebounds, and again, showing his potential, being like Jokic is throwing 2.5 dimes a night off the bench as a center. But now, with the likes of Christian Wood off the team, his second season would give him the opportunity to start on a very dysfunctional Rockets team and have the time to really test himself as a player in today's game and be more of a factor in his team's, well, lack of success. Anyways, his second season in the NBA came with a lot of success as he averaged 15 points, 9 rebounds, and 4 assists a game, which, if you look at Jokic's second season, is very, very similar to how he performed. In that same season, even though he see himself as the fourth option on the totem pole shot attempt wise, Sengun would earn two triple doubles, 29 double doubles, which ranked him 20th in the NBA, and we see him score a career high 33 points against the Lakers. But now, in the 2024 season, Sengun and the Rockets would see a full renovation of their team and a new coach in M.A. Udoka. And M.A. Udoka made it very clear that Sengun is the future of this team, and he has done nothing but shown out and even get all star consideration from fans and NBA enthusiasts alike. At this time, he's averaging a team and career high 21 points per game with eight rebounds and a career high of five assists per night. And if it wasn't for the fact that Fred Van Vliet was on their team as the main playmaker, he would probably be the nucleus of their offense. But that just means he can focus more on scoring at the moment. And this year, you'd really see him take charge like the team wants him to and needs him to, to get more wins. Whether it was his 37 point masterclass while garnering 17 free throw attempts against the Pelicans, him demolishing Victor Wimbanyama a few nights ago to the recording of this video for a career high 45 points and 16 rebounds and then the next game against the Clippers getting a triple double in a back-to-back. -back. Sengu's potential is truly through the roof but he could still be rough around the edges at times and will still certainly need to a few more running mates or him needing to improve the seed but the Rockets can truly do to take the next step in this rebuild which got boosted due to the signings of Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks but with Alperin Sengun at the helm I wouldn't be surprised to see him really take off like Jokic soon, or at least have the impact of DeMontis Sabonis with the Kings as the offensive nucleus. The 2022 NBA draft was also described as a pretty underwhelming draft class, but it also came with its own set of names that was expected to compete and produce immediately. Of course, the first time all-star Apollo Bencaro, the third place block leader and unicorn in Chet Holmgren, and the owner of the most threes in a rookie season, Keegan Murray. And of course, the steady scorer Jabari Smith Jr. But of course, someone got drafted due to a meteoric rise in their junior year in college and at a small school at that, and a team decided to take the bait to see how he'd do in the NBA. And that would be the 12th overall pick of the 2022 class, Jalen Williams from Santa Clara. Coming out of high school, he was a rather unknown recruit, being regarded as the 230th best player of the 2019 class as a six foot three point guard. But with the prospect of playing immediately, he would go to Santa Clara and be their starting point guard. But in his freshman year, he would see a lot of growing pains, only scoring seven points a game and then 11 points per game in his sophomore year. But where things started to click is where he came into his junior year at six foot six and completely dominated the West Coast Conference as a tall and athletic guard. Going from 6'3 to 6'6 as a guard opens up many doors for him and add that alongside the development that we'd see from Jalen, turning into a completely different player now as the West Coast Conference best scorer at 18 points per game, earning all first team honors in this conference and having shooting splits of 51% from the field and 39% from three on three attempts per game. That right there screams NBA player and I guess he must have heard the noise of his stock rising and took the opportunity not returning for his senior year. And with their second of three first round picks, the OKC Thunder drafted the Santa Clara product to potentially be their forward of the future. Because at the time, OKC was starting people like Darius Baisley, Aaron Wiggins, Jeremiah Robinson Earl, and many other characters at their forward spot. And almost immediately, we see him create a role on the team and synchronize his skill set very well to Shea Gillius Alexander, who is now a 30 point per game score. In his rookie season, he averaged 14 points per game while being a consistent three level score and having a serviceable three point shot. So the Thunder right then and there knew that they had a forward with huge upside that can really be a core piece on this Thunder squad. And coming into the next season, this current one right now, his sophomore year, he continued his play from the year before and somehow became
became an even bigger threat and a consistent score. And even though he only shoots three three-pointers a night, he shoots in an amazing 45% clip and scoring 20 points per game. A jump you don't really see from a rookie to sophomore jump very often, especially considering he's the second option on this OKC Thunder team and playing perfectly off of SGA. And when he's had to step up this year, he has done it plenty of times and kept the same production, scoring over 30 points five times this year, and all of them being over 50% from the field. So it's safe to say very early in this lifespan of the 2022 draft class, Jalen Williams is certainly one of the best players in the class, and if he can keep improving, we might even see an all-star appearance out of him in his future, especially if the Thunder can stay as successful as they are now as the first seed in the Western Conference. At the time that I am making this video, who knows how soon this video will be released. And now lastly, the most recent class, the 2023 draft class. Of course, this class will always be highlighted by the Frenchman Victor Wimbenyama, but overall, this class already in the rookie seasons have shown a lot to be desired and have played their roles very well on their respective teams. Whether it's Hammy Hawkwest Jr. for the Heat, Pods for the Warriors, Gigi Jackson for the Grizzlies, and despite his shooting woes, Keontae George of the Utah Jazz. But for my pick of the steal of the 2023 draft class as of right now, I'll give it to the 20th pick of the class class cam Whitmore. But what is pretty funny about this is the fact that he was most certainly supposed to be a top 10 pick, if not a top five pick coming into the class. As a five-star recruit, he had high expectations to show out in one year at whichever college he chose and then turning it into a long and luxurious NBA career. But he ended up choosing former college powerhouse Villanova as their highest rated recruit in a long time. But in his freshman year, he'd see inconsistent playing time and an inconsistent role on the team that kind of made his perception going to the next level kind of weird. But anyone who looked deeply already knew that Cam was trying to make the most out of his time there and it was all about getting buckets at that point. If he went to a college that would have prioritized him offensively he would have for sure gone top five with his skill set but going to nova made that a bit harder but overall scoring 12 points per game on great splits for a college player shows that he's a great scorer and could compound that even more in the open nba but while his concerns for his future stayed the same what was the final nail in the coffin for his lottery status came when a rumor went around that cam whitmore's knee was in terrible shape and a concern and his interviews for some reason being very underwhelming and let me just say just take a little bit of a break. I hate that people take the interview section of the pre-draft process seriously at times. But due to that, he fell all the way down to the 20th spot where he joins a very young and exciting Rockets team. And it's a team where he'd have very big opportunities immediately. In the summer league, he averaged 19 points to two and a half steals a game, showing off his shot creation skills and athleticism to everybody. And it only showed most teams made a huge mistake not drafting him immediately despite the quote unquote rumors. And this season could have been something great for him if it wasn't for the fact that the Houston Rockets signed Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks that moved him to the G League initially. But he was way too good for the G League, scoring 26 points per game and dominating team after team. So now he's finally moved up and has a very limited role on the Rockets rotation, averaging 17 minutes a night and 37 games played so far. But even if it's limited, Cam Whitmore does so much in that time, averaging 12 points a game in those 17 minutes, which is crazy efficient and dynamic for a very score. That alongside the fact that he shoots over 45% in the field in that very limited time and has an above average three-point shot so far, Cam Whitmore has a real chance to be one of the better scorers in the NBA, already owning an NBA type body and top tier NBA athleticism. I am very aware that the players I named earlier are doing more in their roles right now, but I truly think long term that the Rockets got a top five to ten worthy talent with the 20th pick in the class and he's absolutely showing himself to be that. He just needs more minutes to show his value to get to that place on the team and with Emi Udoka comparing him and Jalen Green to a T-Mac and VC type duo in the future I do believe his time will come and I do also believe that he will take advantage of that and be a major contributor to the Rockets soon so when it comes to the art of getting a steal in the draft it comes in many forms whether taking a risk on an unknown product seeing the value in a college stud making the most of an underwhelming freshman year when he's supposed to have potential and many other ways but all of them have the same thing in common they all found a team that believed in them, giving them a chance to succeed at the next level, and those players all made the most out of those opportunities, all either being all-stars, upcoming all-stars, or in Jordan Poole's case, well, I'm not really sure, but he has a championship, so that has to mean something. Tell me your thoughts on this topic. Do you think someone else deserves to have the steel label that I missed? Tell me what else you'd like me to talk about for a topic, and until next time.